So as Pastor Fuko was mentioning, one of the things that we learned about was the fact that when we're doing evangelism, we use what we call Christ's method of evangelism. Does anyone know what Christ's method of evangelism actually is? Does anyone remember from the presentation from yesterday? What was his method? What did he do? He mingled with people as one who desires their good. Then what does he do? He ministered to their needs and then sympathized with them, won their confidence, and then he bade them follow me. So what we want to do in this presentation is to say, okay, so that's how Christ ministers to people as an individual laborer. How can we translate Christ's method of evangelism into something that the church as a body can follow? Because if evangelism is going to unite the church and build up the church body, then how can we as a church mingle with people? How can we as a church win the people's confidence? How can we minister the needs, sympathize with them, and bid them to follow Christ? So what we're going to be going through is what we call the cycle of evangelism, and it's essentially Christ's method of evangelism applied to the church body as a whole, if that makes sense. Before I go into the seven, well, the presentation proper, I just want to say a short word of prayer, and then we can um, continue on. So let us just pray. Um, dear Heavenly Father, I want to thank you again for this time that we have to go through your words, to go through the scriptures. And I ask that as we read and as we study together, you may open up our minds and our understanding that we might be able to see how we can be able to reach the people of Stoke um, as a church body for you, for Jesus Christ. In your holy and precious name, I pray, amen. So the cycle of evangelism. How many of us have heard of the cycle of evangelism before? How many of us are not familiar with the concept? You've never heard of it before? Okay, so we have an even split, you could say. So the cycle of evangelism, what it basically is, is that as with many things that Jesus did, you can look at the truth of evangelism from um, a natural perspective where Jesus takes lessons from nature to illustrate a spiritual reality. And so the cycle of evangelism is basically how can we liken evangelism to something that happens in the natural world? It's almost like a parable. And we're going to be looking at one of Jesus' parables to illustrate this fact. So just to give you a bit of background, how many of us here are actively involved in evangelism? And how many of us are not as actively involved? Perhaps. Not as active. The rest, he said. So let's say for those of us, um, how many of us are baptized members of the church? How many of us have been in the church for more than 10 years? Maybe more than five years? It should be, it should be going up. The numbers should be going up as we reduce the age range, but it's like everyone's put their hands down. Um, how many of us have been in the church for at least a year, let's say? You've been baptized for at least a year. At least one year in the church. I guess that applies to the majority of us here. Now, in your time of, with Christ, in your time in the church, how many of you have reached out to somebody and brought somebody else into the church within your one year or more of being in the church? So what we see is that with the church, the idea of being a disciple as opposed to just being a member is that every single person, once you're in the church, you play your part to getting somebody else where you now are. Now, for those of us who are not actively involved, what would you say is like the biggest barrier? What, what do you struggle with the most? Fear. Fear of? So fear of knocking doors and talking to people. What particularly about that experience frightens you? So the fear of rejection, what else? Not knowing the answer to the questions? Just, or just being shy, so some point just naturally shy. And then you had one more. So not knowing whether or not what you know is enough to meet the needs of the people outside. So that's like a variety of different issues. Um,
Yes. So it's that whole idea of maybe I'm afraid to go out because I don't feel as equipped to fulfill the obligation that Christ has placed upon my heart to win people to Christ. Is that a fair assumption, fair summary of where we are? I think we can take comfort from the experience of Jesus' disciples because remember the story when Jesus actually called the disciples? Do you remember what he called them to do? What was, to be, what was their job description? <laughs> I've lost my slides. If someone can put them up again, please. But if you turn your Bibles... Oh. Right. So we're looking at the book of Matthew chapter 4. Matthew 4, verse 18. If someone can just read that for us, please. Matthew 4, verse 18, when you find it, just read that for us. And there are certain things that we can learn from the passage that we can take comfort from as well as inspiration. Matthew chapter 5, chapter 4, verse 18 to verse 20. Thank you very much. Did anyone catch what just happened in this picture? Jesus is walking by there, by the shore. He's walking along the shore by the seaside, and he sees two brothers. Who were they? Peter and Andrew. And then they were what kind of people? Fishermen. And then he says to them, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Now, what did Jesus imply by saying, I will make you fishers of men? What, what does it mean to be a fisher of men? Telling people about the Lord is basically is evangelism. I will make you fishers of men. Now, here is the thing. Jesus saying to them, he wants them to be involved in the work of evangelism. But were they experienced in that work before? Were they qualified? <laughs> Had they been educated in the theological schools? So how was it that they were going to become fishers of men? Jesus said he would do what? He would make them. Have you ever thought that the call to evangelism is actually a promise and not just simply a command? That when Jesus says, follow me and I will make you fishers of men, he's not just simply saying what he wants us to be doing, but he wants to do in us as well. So sometimes we often say, I can't do what Jesus wants me to do because I don't think I am equipped to do what he is asking me to do. And we miss the point that perhaps in the calling itself is the promise that he will enable us to become what he wants us to do. So Jesus is not just saying, go and fish for people. He's saying, I will make you fishers of men. That's a promise as well as a command. But, but according to you, it's, it's when you are in the church, you are in the church, and if I say, Exactly. And exactly. And exactly. And you know, when you look back at the things that we said are the barriers, we said it's the fear of rejection, it's the fear of not knowing enough. It's the fear of, I guess, us being shy. Those are limitations that we place upon our own ability. Would you agree? We don't think we are capable, therefore it's not possible. What we've said is that we have limited Jesus' ability to our ability. <laughs> and it reminds us of, I mean, this is like a problem so many different times in the scriptures. Do you remember that point when they were by the promised land, Canaan, in the book of Numbers? And then they send spies, and then God says, no, go into the land. And then they said, we can't go because they're giants. You know, there were so many obstacles. And because we don't see how we can overcome the obstacles, we're not going to go. And so God says he could not work with them because 
they refuse to place their faith in him. And so sometimes I think as a church body, we weaken our, our strength by looking too much at what we are able and not able to do, that we forget that God is able to do exceedingly and abundantly above all that we can ask or think according to his power that works in us. But his power begins to work in us when we actually are willing to be made fishers of men. And so for Peter and for James and Andrew and John, this was the beginning of their ministry, and now we see them as giants, but they did not really know that much beforehand. Yes. Thank you very much. And really what it is, is that as we discussed this morning, the disciples, when they were called, their job description was to be fishers of men. And as a collective body of disciples, our job description remains the same. There is this quote that is taken from the book Acts of the Apostles, um, page 9. It says, the church is God's appointed what? Agency for the salvation of men. Now, I want to ask a question. What is an agent? What does it mean for someone to be an agent? Someone that employs somebody. Someone that employs somebody. So let's say, for example, if you want to buy a house, where do you go? To a, an agency, you know, like an estate agent. <laughs> and you, what do you do? Do you give them a blank check and walk out? What do you do? You tell them what you're looking for. You, you know, you want a three-bedroom house. You know, it's detached. You want it to have a swimming pool or whatever else that you might want. You want a microwave. You want to be in this kind of neighborhood. And then the agent, they go out of their way to say, I have found something that suits your needs. Yes? So the Bible, well, the quote says that we are God's agency. That means that God has a specific objective that he's trying to accomplish, and he's going to accomplish it through us. But it means then that if we are doing God's work, he does not just give us a blank check to do whatever we want. We have to be willing to see how does God want this objective to be accomplished. In the same sense that if you give an agent money, you don't expect that they will follow and get the kind of house that you want, not the kind of house that they want. Is there a problem that, is there a danger even, that sometimes we do evangelism our way and then expect God to bless it at the end? Or do we say before we begin the work, what are our marching orders from God's word, and then we act as agents after having received what God wants us to do? And so the first part is God empowers us, but the second part is that God gives us our marching orders. What is it that we're actually supposed to be doing while we're doing evangelism? What's the end goal? The end goal is not what we feel comfortable doing. It's not what we think is the most attractive thing to do, but it's what does God actually want to accomplish during the work of evangelism? Then we go and do that. That's what makes us agents. The church is God's appointed agency for the salvation of men. It was what? organized for service, and its mission is to carry the gospel into the world. Those are our marching orders, and it's basically what we're talking about in, in the morning, divine service, prophesying again. That is the purpose of the church, to share the everlasting gospel throughout the whole world. Now, have you ever had sometimes one of the, the difficulties that comes about is the fact that we're trying to reach the whole world, and looking in an, an, each and every church. How many of you, let's say for example, if you were to make a decision, if I was to ask, for example, my brother here, what is your favorite dish? If you were to have a perfect dinner party, what would be the main course? Sorry? You don't eat? You must know something. Come on, what, 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 <laughs> what do you usually like eating? Pizza and macaroni. 
Okay, we'll give you curry goat. So that's your favorite dish. Um, how about yourself? No, no, what is your favorite dish? He doesn't exist on these shores. Oh, okay, right. So he has a special dish that no one knows about. He, but he'll introduce us to one day. Does anyone have a favorite dish that we might know about? Akbar? Rice. Flavored rice. Not just any rice. Flavored rice. There's a difference. <laughs> But essentially, we're talking about something as simple as putting a menu together, and everyone will have different ideas. Someone wants flavored rice, someone wants plain rice, someone wants brown rice, and someone wants jollof, someone will want jollof rice. But <laughs> when we're coming together, we all have different opinions, we all have different perspectives of looking at the world. And the more diverse we become as a church, the more different opinions we will have. And so when we sit together as a church and we say, we want to find out what God wants us to do, there has to be, even in the first part, a willingness to put our self and our preferences aside. Can you see that if everyone has their own preferences, you won't actually get anywhere? Yeah. It's not about what you used to do back home, wherever home might be. It's about what needs to be done here and what the needs of the people in Stoke are. Because if you can't even agree on that as a premise, you won't get very far. And you see it often, you know, we go to different churches and there's always someone who wants to do things the way they used to do them 10 years ago, when they were in London or in, in Glasgow, and they're now in Stoke and they're saying, we used to do this in London. It's like, that's great, but what needs to be done here? And so the first step really, as part of preparing ourselves, is the fact that we want to know what needs to be done here and being willing to conform to the needs of Stoke and not necessarily the preferences of our past, as glorious as they might have been. Yeah. Yeah, thank you very much. Now, I can see we haven't actually started talking about the cycle of evangelism yet. I'm just laying the premise. So I'll take the points at the end. Perhaps we'll oh, actually, what I'm going to do, Akbar and I, we agree that we're going to have a sort of kind of like a QA at the end. So you can write your questions as we go along. It's good to sort of like be interactive as well, but I want to get through the slides. Um, and I still have 23 more to go through. But we've laid the framework already anyway. Uh, so here we're talking about the fact that sometimes we always do a certain thing in the past, and sometimes we might find a need that requires something new. And this quote just basically um, consolidates that idea even further. It's taken from the book Evangelism, page 105. And it says, men are needed who do what? Who pray to God for wisdom, and who under the guidance of God can put new life into the old methods of labor, and can invent new plans and new methods of awakening the interest of church members enriching the men and women of the world. And so here you see that there's a combination of putting new life into the old methods, but also inventing new methods. So it doesn't mean that we throw away what used to be done in the past, but maybe we just need to revamp it a little bit to make it work in 2017 Stoke. But at the same time, we should not be complacent. We should always be looking for new ways of doing things. So just because something has never been done before does not necessarily mean that it should not be done. But all of this is underlined by the fact that people are praying to who? God for wisdom. And that's the important thing, that when we're getting our marching orders from God, we'll be able to invent new ideas which are still in keeping with God's designs. 
the quote goes on to say that there must be no fixed rules. Our work is a progressive work. There must be room left up for methods to be improved upon, but under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, what must be preserved? Unity must be preserved. So evangelism unites the church, but if you do it incorrectly, it can also divide the church. But if we're praying to God for wisdom, then it will unite. So how does this unity work? I don't know if you have this in Stoke, but usually what we have is what's called the Personal Ministries Council. Do you have a Personal Ministries Council in Stoke, Pastor? A Personal Ministries, PM Council? Oh yeah, so you have a church board. It's basically the same thing, I guess. You have the leaders of the different departments come together saying, you know, okay, if the church needs, if Stoke, for example, needs something to do with education, then you'd have like the education department that can help to spear forward that aspect of the work, if that makes sense. So everyone is chipping in, but it's almost like you have different players on the same team. You're still trying to get the ball into the same goal, but you might play in different positions. So it's, it's important that when we come together as a church board, we're not coming together to advance the ideas and the designs of our department, but rather we're seeing what role or what part can my department play in fulfilling the goal of the church. Can you see the difference? Yeah. So you're still representing your department, but you're saying how does my department fit into the vision of the larger church rather than how can I fit the larger church into the vision of my department? Because that's how you get division, whereas the other way is how you get unity, because you're working together. So how do you actually do this as a church? The cycle of evangelism, it has six approaches, six phases, and I'll just put them here um, shortly. The first thing is personal preparation. Then preparing the soil, sowing the seeds, cultivating the harvest, harvesting, preserving the harvest, and then you do personal preparation again, which is why it's a cycle. And we'll break this down step by step, but those are the six phases of the cycle of evangelism. And to do this, we're going to be using one of the well-known parables in the Bible. It's taken from the book of Matthew chapter 13. Verse 4, we're going to begin with. The parable of the sower. The parable of the sower. Matthew chapter 13, verse 4. If someone finds that for us, can they read it for us, please? Oh, sorry. Can you go to the beginning of the story? I can't remember what verse is. Is it verse 1? Thank you very much. So we said that the first phase of the cycle of evangelism is what? Can everyone remember? Personal preparation. Now, how does this passage bring out the idea of personal preparation? Matthew 13, verse 4 says, who went to sow? It doesn't say it was a carpenter, for example, but he was a sower. A sower is somebody who is... He is um, skilled, you could say, in the art of sowing agriculture. But his objective is to actually do the work that he's going to do. Does that make sense? So in order, he wasn't born a sower, let's say. He became a sower at some point, and now he's going out to do what sowers do. So before the work begins, there was some kind of a preparation within the person himself, which fitted him up for the work. Jesus said, I will make you fishers of men, then they went to fish for people. But there was a personal preparation that took place in them which enabled them to do the work. So here we see that there is a sower who goes out to sow the seed. When Jesus begins to break down the passage later on in Matthew chapter 13, he said that the seed represents what? The word of God. So if someone is going out to sow the word of God, it means that they actually had it in the first place. It means that they've actually studied the truth for themselves in the first place. And then they've learned something. Remember, they've eaten of the book, Revelation chapter 10, 
and now they're going out to sow what they have received from God. So the first part is that we can't really have an effective ministry as a church if the members of the church themselves are not familiar with the truth that they're supposed to be preaching. Again, another quote, it says, our mission to the world is not to serve or please ourselves. We are to glorify God by cooperating with him to save sinners. We are to, what? Ask for blessings from God that we may communicate to others. Then it says that the capacity of receiving is preserved only by imparting. So here what we're saying is that we have to ask God to give us his word so that we can share with other people. But we can only receive more and more from God if we give more and more away. So truly it is more blessed to give than to receive, which means then some of us were saying that we are afraid to go out and share the word of God because we don't know enough. Guess how you get to know more? By giving away the little that you have. You know the story of the little boy who had how many loaves and how many fishes? <laughs> and how did they become enough to feed 5,000? He gave. The more you give what you have, the more you receive, and the greater your ability to give. So we often say, I can't give because I don't have enough to give, not knowing that that's exactly how you get more. So the first step is you have to be willing to share the little that you know. And then God will increase your capacity to give. Before you give, let's say, for example, if you wanted to plant, if I have a favorite fruit, like a pineapple or a mango tree, they all have, someone saying, yes, mangoes, but, <laughs> or even like grapes, they all have different requirements. There's certain fruits that cannot grow in England because England is just not suitable in terms of weather, in terms of the soil, to allow that seed to grow. So we have to import them from different countries. In the same sense, we have these seeds, but we have a selection of truth in our Bible. And in order to actually get some growth before you start planting, there has to be a preparation of the soil to receive the seeds that we want to sow. And so here the Bible says that the sower goes out to sow, but before he starts sowing, I can assure you that he's done some work to prepare the ground to receive the seed. What happens if you leave the ground and you don't touch it at all? You get, you get nothing. Well, you get something. You get weeds. <laughs> you get tears. You get dandelions and all of those different things. If you don't mow your lawn, that's what happens, right? So you have to prepare the way. Sometimes people have barriers to knowing God. And we have to prepare people to know the way. And Aqua will go on to show about different things about how we can be able to do that work. But really, the only thing that can melt the hearts of people is by introducing them to the love of Jesus in a practical way. Sometimes we often think, I want to win people by arguments. But really, it's not about winning an argument, it's about winning hearts. That's what prepares people to receive us. Jesus often, again, we're talking about the cycle of evangelism and Christ's method. He talks about how he mingled with people as one who desired their good. You know, he sympathized with their needs. He ministered to those needs, and then he won their confidence. He was preparing the soil before he said, follow me. But often in our evangelistic efforts, we start by going to a random stranger and say, follow Jesus. <laughs> but we haven't done everything else beforehand. We haven't prepared the soil. We've just thrown the seed. So the circle of evangelism is saying, how can we as a church prepare the soil? We have to actually mingle with the people in church, in Stoke. Not just our immediate vicinity here, but even people that we work with. People that we go to school with. We can share the love of Jesus in a practical way, even without necessarily opening up the Bible to them. We can still be winning their confidence. Does that make sense? So evangelism does not start by your ability to break down a particular passage, but your ability to love selflessly, disinterested love. That's where that begins. We're showing Jesus in a practical way. That melts hearts, and it actually makes them want to know more about why you are different. Preparing the soil. 
Then there's obviously the sowing the seed. The Bible says that the seed itself represents what? The word of God. It is very easy to do a lot of different things as evangelism, which do not actually increase people's ability or desire to know the word of God. What I mean is that sometimes we can have different activities, but if we don't see how it's going to, in the end, at some point, allow us to introduce the word of God, then it's not necessarily always the most effective form of labor. It's very easy, and we have to be careful, that our evangelistic efforts as a church do not just simply turn into a form of entertainment for the community, where they'll come and they'll come and they'll come for 10 years, but they'll never be introduced to Jesus. It has to be a progressive work. It has to be a systematic process, but at the point, there has to be something that enables us to introduce Jesus. Otherwise, if we don't introduce Jesus at some point, we're not actually sowing any seeds. And so it's important that we realize that whatever idea we might have, a new idea, we have to also think, how does this, in the end, lead us to being able to introduce people to the word of God? Because if it doesn't, it's not necessarily an effective way of witnessing. But even before we go that, when you think about evangelism, Jesus, before he left, in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, if someone can just read that for us, please. Acts chapter 1, verse 8. We were number three of six, and we're nearly done. Acts chapter 1, verse 8, this is Jesus' message to his disciples just before he left to go to heaven. And he's trying to strengthen them in the work of evangelism that they had been left to do in his absence, even though he was still represented by the Holy Spirit. Thank you very much. So here it says that they shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes. Can you see the order in which they would become witnesses? Where were they going to go first? Jerusalem and then? Judea and then? What's the pattern? What's the logic? What's going on there? Sorry? Have you ever heard the statement that says, love begins at home? So these people are in Jerusalem. It doesn't make sense to go from Jerusalem to Samaria to preach the gospel when there are people in Jerusalem who don't know the gospel. And so here we've been told that it starts off in Jerusalem, then it goes to Judea, then it goes to Samaria. It goes outside. So when Jesus was saying that salvation is of the Jews, he wasn't saying that no one else deserves to be saved, but he was saying if you can't minister at home, how can you minister further away? Sometimes our idea of evangelism is we want to meet Joe Bloggs on the street and give him a tract. But what about our brothers and sisters who don't know Jesus? What about our friends? What about our neighbors? Because the reality of it is, again, this is where the, the Christ method comes in. Jesus, before he bids them follow me, what does he do? He wins their confidence. Now, who has more confidence in you, your friend or a stranger? But we often bypass our friends to go to the stranger to say they should follow Jesus. Yes. And so what we find is that we have to find a way of turning our casual friendships into witnessing opportunities. Our familiar relationships into witnessing opportunities. I'm sure we can all think of different loved ones, perhaps, that we know who are not in the faith. We can think about different relatives. I'm sure someone here who knows a friend or a family member who does not believe in God at all, maybe, or does not believe in the truth for this time. Would it give you greater satisfaction to go and win somebody in China while your own family are lost in the end? And so we have to also pray to God, how can we find the wisdom to reach those who are closest to us? And that requires us to be very consistent with our faith, which is why sometimes it makes it difficult, because they know us the best. But it's a challenge for us to live our lives to the fullest, so that those who see us every day may actually be drawn to the truth that we claim to believe. Um, 
just going another again, you know, once someone has sown seeds and they have taken up roots and they've started to grow, is that enough? Do you then just leave them and then wait until the harvest? You have to nurture. Why do you have to nurture? Because weeds come, tears come in the same patch of land that you're expecting crops. And so even after you've introduced someone to Jesus, is that the end of the, the journey? No, you have to continue reaching out, continue to grow that crop, that harvest until it's ripe. And so it's not enough to just go into the community and just knock a door once. Sometimes it takes time. It's a process. Just because someone does not accept an invitation to come to church one day does not mean that they will never come. It's a process, it's a growing process. But it also means that there will be opportunities that come into that person's life which might turn them away from the truth. And we have to be praying for the people because you never know what the devil might throw in their way. I don't know if you've ever had an experience where you've witnessed to somebody and they're warming up and then something bad happens and they just switch off. It happens all the time because the tears come. And so even in all of our labors, we have to be praying for the people that we're trying to reach, that God would you know, put a hedge around them of some sort, so that the Satan cannot have his way upon those people. Because you know that when you start to awaken spiritual interest, the people will now become a target for the devil's attacks. And so while we're doing all of this work, we have to be praying for the people as well, that our labors will be effective. Again, it's the second parable that Jesus tells the parable of the wheat and the tares. The sower sows good seeds, but then the enemy comes and sows bad seeds. So we just see that in nature there has to be a cultivation of the harvest and a protection of the, the crops. The last phase is the harvesting. Hopefully what, after you've gone through all of this, you're not going to get the, the ripe crop and then just say, oh, you know, I can't be bothered to harvest it. So you actually then go and you reap what you have sown. The Bible puts it in the Great Commission in the following ways, in Matthew 28, verse 18 and 19. It says, and Jesus came and spoke to them, saying what? How much authority? All authority is given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. So baptism becomes kind of like the harvesting point. But notice that baptism is which phase of the cycle? It's number five. How many phases altogether are there? Six. So is baptism the end? No. But often we have to come to the point where we think evangelism is about numbers. And so the end goal is just get someone to the pool and just dunk them like an Oreo and then that's the work done. But we realize that evangelism does not end at baptism, and it doesn't begin there either. So there are two dangers. Number one, sometimes we can rush people to the baptismal pool when they're not ready to be baptized. Or number two, sometimes we baptize people and we think our work is done, and then we leave them. But harvesting is only part of the process, and it's not the end in and of itself. In fact, what we see is that when we move on, to Ooh. number six, preserving the harvest. You know, once the, once the sower has gotten the harvest, he's harvested, what he then has to do is he has to take the wheat or whatever he's, the grain, and he has to put them into the barn to preserve them from the different natural hazards that might come and destroy the crop. But even in that harvest itself, he has the seeds for next year. So he has to preserve the harvest because it's going to be his harvest for the future. So what that means is that when we're bringing people to Christ as disciples, what is a disciple? A disciple is a fisher of men. So part of our evangelism, once someone has come into the church, is to teach them how they can also bring others into the church. How many of you, when you came into the church, someone continued to have Bible studies with you? Someone gave you Bible studies after you were baptized? 
How many of you did not receive Bible studies when you got baptized? It might not necessarily be the same form of Bible studies, but someone has to check up on you, in a sense, and continue to mentor you because we all continue to grow even after we've been baptized. And so it's very important that even now when we have young people here, as a church, are we creating an environment that actually allows the young people and the old people to continue growing spiritually? Because if we cultivate them while they're in the church, we don't have to worry so much about having to reclaim them after they have left the church. So we have to be thinking as a church, not just simply bringing people in, but also thinking, is Stoke Central Church an environment that somebody from the outside would want to come into and stay? So it's not just simply throwing the seeds out there as well, but it's about cleaning up the inside. I'm not saying that there's stuff going on, I don't know, I'm just a stranger. But I'm just saying that we have to also just be thinking about the way we interact on a Sabbath morning. If I was a visitor for the first time, would I want to come back? You know, when you see visitors, do you acknowledge them? Do you greet them? Do you show them compassion and love? Because often someone comes and in the first 10 minutes, they've made their mind up whether or not they'll ever come again. And so while we're thinking about being an evangelistic church, we have to also think, is this an environment that somebody from the outside would want to come into and stay in? Do we love one another? Because if someone hears that Jesus is a loving person and then they come and they see us all fighting, I can guarantee you they won't come back. So we can see evangelism is not just simply about going out there, but it's actually in here reaching out to one another. And that's how evangelism unites the church. But it means that we have to all be on board and then once the person has come in, we continue to prepare each other, prepare them to go and labor all over again. Um, we see this um, great description in the book of Acts chapter 5, I believe, or chapter 2. I don't have my notes on me, unfortunately, but it's on the screen. It describes the apostolic church, and it says that all of them who believed were together, and they had all things in common, and sold their possessions and their goods, and they divided them all among all, as anyone had need, um, Acts chapter 2, verse 44 and 46. But it says they continued daily with one accord, unity. Um, they broke bread, you know, potluck. They shared food. They ate with their food with gladness and simplicity of heart. They praised God together. They had faith with all the people. And what was the end result? The Lord added to the church daily those who were to be saved because the church was the kind of environment that God could entrust his children to come to, God blessed them and sent more and more people. But sometimes, even if we do evangelism, God cannot trust us to safe keep the people outside, so he doesn't work with us as much. But if we are loving, if we are caring, if we are compassionate, then God can send people here knowing that they'll be safe because we're a loving church. Does that make sense? So evangelism, don't think about it as being simply giving Bible studies. We all have a part to play. Their spiritual gifts varied beyond just simply teaching and preaching. You need people with hospitality. You need people with administration. People who are charitable. People who have faith. People who pray. And each and every one of us can think, what can I do to further the work? But the end goal is that as a church, we have to think our marching orders are how to lead people to Christ in our own private lives, and together as a congregation. And then when we do that, God is able to bless our efforts and make it prosperous. Amen? Amen. I'll leave it there. Five more minutes. Sorry? Oh, we're going to take a break. Okay, right. So I just want to say another short word of prayer, and then we'll take a break, and then we'll go into the next session. But let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I want to thank you again for the information that we've just received about how we can be more effective as a church and as individuals to winning hearts and souls and minds for Christ. And I just pray, Lord, that you may place within us a missionary spirit that is also a selfless and humble spirit, that we might be willing to be taught by you um, the things of your kingdom, and that we might be willing to put this into practice and work with you to win souls for your kingdom also. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. So we'll take a five-minute break, which means we'll start again at five minutes past four. 
and then we'll go into the next phase of the program by ACBA, but I'll let Pastor um, clarify. A few more minutes just to add some practical flesh to the ideas that we've just been discussing regarding the evangelism cycle. And Right, so for the evangelism cycle, we say that it has how many phases? Six phases. Does anyone know what the first one is? Preparing the? Preparing the soil? Preparing the self, okay, right. Um, we'll come up with some grammar lessons, but anyway, yeah, preparing the soul. <laughs> Personal preparation, you could say. And then the next one is? Preparing the? And then we have? Sowing the seeds, then? Cultivating the harvest, and then? Harvesting. Preservation of the harvest. And then we go back together again. Now, what I just wanted to take some time to do is what do these look like in a practical way? So when we think about personal preparation, what does that actually mean? It means prayer life has to increase. It means our own personal study life has to increase. So if we're thinking about this as a church and we're saying that we are preparing ourselves to take on the cycle of evangelism, how is your own personal prayer life? You know, how is your own personal study life, your Bible study, your relationship with God personally, how is that? You know, taking time to read things like the Sabbath school lesson, for example, if you don't know where to begin, uh, sermons online, coming to church on time, all of those different things are part of personal preparation and getting our souls to know who Jesus is more. And then when we have a clear understanding of what Jesus means to us, we'll then be, have a motivation to share with other people. So your prayer life, um, your study life, and just your normal relationship with the church comes under personal preparation. Because think about it. How can we bring people into the church and help them to value the church if we ourselves do not demonstrate in our behavior that we value the church? You know, the door? Oh, could somebody close that door for me, please? The glare is blinding people. Okay, yeah. Okay, so, but essentially it means that as a church, I mean, yeah, okay, so personal preparation, I guess as part of a church we've been having weeks of prayer, that's all part of the process, and the more we interact and we participate in that process, the better prepared we will be as individuals and as a church to go into the next days of the cycle. But don't be tempted to think that we have to go and rush through the cycle. But the more thoroughly we spend it, well, the more thoroughly we perform each step, the more successful we'll be when we get to the end of the process. So personal preparation. We need to be spending time in prayer for ourselves. We need to be studying the Bible for ourselves. You know, it means also coming to church on time. There's nothing worse than inviting a visitor to come to church and no one's here. It's so embarrassing. So, you know, if you need to, personal preparation means that our devotion to God's cause personally has to improve. Preparing the soil, it means actually going out and mingling with people. So that includes, for example, the surveys that we do, where we go knocking on the doors and we speak to people. You know, it's very, very rare for someone to walk past the street and just walk into the church out of curiosity to see what's going on. Someone did that today, they walked into the church, but the reason they came is because they were looking for their smartphone, not necessarily for Jesus. But we need to get people to the point where we have to go out to them because they won't necessarily come to us. So we have to be willing to go, and it's not always an easy thing for us in terms of knocking on doors, but that will come as part of the next stages of the cycle where we can learn how do we knock on doors, how do we reach out to people. But even on just like a normal day-to-day -day level, when we speak to our you know, at work, do you speak to your co-workers? 
you know, do you try to reach out to people to learn who they are? Understand where they're coming from. It doesn't always have to be a Jesus conversation. You can talk about many things, but reach out to people. Show that you care about people. Show that you want to know about their lives on a personal level. Our networking skills, and as we do that more and more often, that's also part of ministering for Jesus. It doesn't have to be that every conversation has to be about Jesus, but Jesus can be in each and every conversation, even when his name is not mentioned, by our attitude and just reaching out to the people around us, preparing the soil. It also means that when we find out the needs of the people, when you go to door knocking and say, you know, if people say they want to do a health expo, and then we put on a health expo, kind of like as a bridging community event, before we maybe necessarily sow the seeds of um, the word of God per se, but if the church was having a health expo, would you be willing to come and help out to set up the chairs? You might not know the Bible, but you can't use that as an excuse for setting up the chairs. And so really, it's things like that. We need people to help at the booth, the registration, the welcome desks. We need people to just smile, you know? A smile goes a long way. Um, and it just being part of the process. So there's so many different aspects of the evangelism as a process that there's something that you might be able to do. You, there will be one thing at least that you can do. And it's just having that willingness to say, you know what, when there's something comes up that I know I can help out with, I'll go out of my way and just do something about that. Sowing the seeds, we have, you know, as part of this whole door knocking thing, we might even be giving out some of our books. We might be giving out tracts and Akbar will come and talk about you know, ministering with GLOW, but there's so many different resources that we have now that if you're aware of the resources that we have as a church, you will know which seeds would be better suited for which soil. But you know the soil based on your conversations with them from the beginning. So basically it's about understanding the people and also as part of preparing our soul, we understand what resources we have at our disposal. So the door knocking, giving out books, giving out tracts, speaking to people and just sharing messages verbally as well, and encouraging people, telling people that you're praying for them, for example, when they're going through a difficult moment in time. That's all part of sowing the soil, sowing the seeds. We talk about cultivating the harvest, and I mean, these are things that we do, for example, if somebody has de um, demonstrated or manifested an interest in knowing the word of God more formally, you know, keeping in touch with them will make a massive difference. Even when you're having Bible studies with people, there's still also a social aspect to the Bible studies. You don't just simply go and then just give them Bible studies, but you also show that, you know, how are things with you? And you realize, really, when you start to break it down, that at its most fundamental core, evangelism is simply networking. That's all it is, socializing with people. Just as you speak to them about food or sports, you speak to them about Jesus. But it requires you to have a relationship with people. And those relationships grow stronger and stronger the more and more the longer and longer you know those people. And those are cultivation that we can do even in our church. Do you simply just say happy Sabbath to each other? Or do you actually want to know how people are? Do you speak during the week? Or is it only when you bump into each other during tithes and offerings or the intercessory prayers? And so while we cultivate and we practice relating to one another in the church, we'll be preparing to actually relate to people who come from outside of the church to also have to be in God's house. We also have to be open-minded in terms of cultivating the harvest. If somebody came in here and they were a drug addict, how would you respond? Would you all freak out or would you welcome them with open arms? Because those are the people you're trying to reach. So when they come here, how are you gonna respond? You know, so it's about being open-minded and just being willing to reach out to anybody and everybody and ministering to their needs as and when they come. Harvesting, we know about it, it's about, Bible, it's about baptism. There's a process, you have baptismal lessons. You encourage people before and after the process. And I guess we have harvesting campaigns as well. You're having a campaign with Pastor Adam. That might not necessarily be a harvesting campaign, I believe, it's just part of the process. Sorry? Revival and Reformation, so it's part of the preparing the soil, the soul aspect of things. But then you can have another campaign when the time is ripe to actually then harvest something. But in order to have a harvest, you must have sown some seeds at the beginning. So you can see how each and every stage prepares for the next. But the main thing is that you, know, you have a pastor who is well versed in the cycle of evangelism 
And as a church, he's trying to look at things at a bigger picture. And so really, it's like we all input into that process and we take hold of the vision as a whole. And we think, okay, how can we move as a church from place to place? You know, when the church was going from Exodus, from Egypt to the Promised Land, they didn't go off in scatter groups. They left when everyone was ready. They moved as a unit. And it's the same process that we have to be willing to move as a unit. You might be ready to do one thing, but we have to work together to make the process work. So I'm now going to hand over to Akbar, who's going to talk more about the GLOW process. Um, not just the GLOW, but just simply connecting with our community and how we can bring Jesus and give light into our world. Akbar. <laughs> 